The Y Curve with Phil Dobby and Roger Hearing. Welcome along. Unless you came here by boat, of course, in which case you're not welcome at all. We've already announced the UK and Rwanda Migration and Economic Development Partnership, which will address the shared international challenge of illegal migration and break the business model of the people smuggling gangs. Today we examine the UK government's plans to send some of those arriving by boat across the channel packing to Rwanda. And we get the views of Migration Watch UK's Chair Alp Mehmet, who thinks it's a fantastic idea. Uh, Already this year, we are getting on for three times the number crossing in, in rickety, dangerous little boats across the channel from a safe country very often having already applied and been rejected for uh, asylum in uh, countries across Europe. But is that enough reason for a solution like this? And will it work? Well, whilst we were watching Paddington Bear having tea with the Queen, the UK government was planning the first flight to Rwanda for refugees who sought asylum in the UK. Today, what is the advantage for the UK in sending some asylum seekers to Rwanda? And why Rwanda? All of that is coming up. The Y Curve. Yes, welcome to the first edition of The Y Curve. I'm Phil Dobby. Roger Hearing is uh, sitting opposite me as well. I am, I am. And, and we're really going to do something special with this, aren't we? we oh, well, let, let's hope so. Let's see how it goes. We've only just started, but uh, we'll give it, give it our best shot. Now, the, um, the story today is very topical. We're looking at Rwanda very much in the news right now. Yeah, well, mainly because of the British government plan to send uh, asylum seekers, uh, illegal migrants, as they call them, uh, to Rwanda, and very much in the news because uh, the illegal process to stop it has already begun. In fact, there's already an application for judicial review in the High Court. In theory, the first group of asylum seekers, up to 30 or so, are going to be flown out on Tuesday, but not even the government really thinks that's going to happen. Now, what all this comes down to, and we're going to look at this in some depth, is, in my opinion, three questions. Mm -hmm. Is it legal? Is it ethical? And will it work? Yeah, we can look at all of those. Another question is, why Rwanda? out of anywhere in the world. Uh, I mean, Boris has said that, you know, we need to stop those people smugglers uh, who are turning uh, the channel into a watery graveyard. There's lots of comparisons with what's been going on in Australia, and we'll look at that in the next half hour. But Rwanda, is it a safe place? I mean, because if not, there is something quite unethical, isn't there, about sending people fleeing danger and civil liberties in their own country to to another country where they may face more of the same. Yeah, no, Rwanda is a, a fascinating example because it is one of those countries which has sort of been embraced by Britain, particularly by the Conservative Party. In fact, not even just the government in the last 20 or 30 years, of course, most famously in the headlines in 1994 for the genocide that went on there. I was there covering at the time. It's a country I know well. Mm. I also know the president reasonably well, interviewed him a few times. Uh, Let me say, I don't think anyone who has looked at the human rights record would say this is a safe country. But hasn't it moved on? I mean, genocide was, what, 20, 25 years ago? It was a while ago. Yeah, in 1994. I mean, things have moved on a lot. I mean, people who go there say it looks amazing uh, these days. It's Mm. uh, the Switzerland or whatever. very clean, apparently. You can't take plastic bags in there, Roger. Yeah, what it's really clean of, though, is anyone to oppose the president. Because the point is you don't last long, inside or outside the country. Uh, I mean, our government called it one of the world's safest nations. I mean, even the British government in 2021 regretted at the UN that Rwanda had not accepted its recommendation to conduct transparent credible and independent investigations into allegations of human rights violations, including deaths in custody and torture. That's the British government mentioning that just a year ago. And back in 2011, the Met Police in London warned Rwandan exiles living there they faced an imminent threat of assassination at the hands of the Rwandan government. Does that sound safe? Well, no, but, but then you see, uh, you're saying that, but I'm, I've am i watched Willy Fungo, uh, who does travelogues yes. on YouTube. You, you, and you do he, spend your time doing strange things. <laughs> and uh, Willy uh, has only good things to say about the Kigali Heights shopping centre. This is, this is the vision that they're trying to portray of Rwanda. Don't miss the Kigali Heights Mall. It is without a doubt the best vibe anywhere in Africa right now. If Wakanda was a real place, it would look like Kigali Heights on a lively afternoon. I've never seen so many beautiful and well-dressed African people 
in one place. Now, there's a man who knows how to present, Roger. Uh, mm, yes, all right. I mean, I, I'm sure it has a lovely shopping centre. Everyone I know who's been there recently says that it does look amazing. That is not that is not the fundamental question here, because what we're talking about is the ethics of sending people to a place where there is grave risk mm. uh, to their lives, because this is not a government that stints um, at, at killing its opponents. We know that my, my friend Michaela Rong has written about this. She wrote about it back in the 90s. She's written about it much more recently as well. Says this is a frightening place. That's the way she describes it. And all this buys into the, one of those fundamental questions I mentioned. Is it an ethical policy? Yeah, absolutely. And is it and is it legal? And and also, who are we sending there? So if we had a Ukrainian family, for example, who washed up on our shores, who got here by boat because they couldn't get the paperwork sorted out fast enough, and these obviously are desperate people, if a Ukrainian family arrived, would we send them to Rwanda? Not a I, chance. <laughs> I don't think so. And that is part of the issue uh, with the uh, with the legislation that's being drawn up. There was a there was a session in the Human Rights Committee yesterday in Parliament. Uh, Colin Yeo is a barrister at Garden Court Chambers and he made this point on that selective discrimination uh, at the hearing yesterday. And one of the difficulties in talking about this scheme is that th there's a lot that we don't know about who's being picked on here for removal. So for example the, the Memorandum of Understanding um, applies to all asylum seekers who arrive in the UK but as I understand it only a very narrow class of those people are being targeted by the Home Office for removal and I, one of the issues that's raised by that is, is that if you've got a very large class of people to whom a law or an agreement or whatever applies but you only select a handful of them for targeting under that, there's an obvious risk of discrimination. Yeah, and that's a bit scary, isn't it? But that is only part of the legal question. And we'll come back to that legal question because your three questions that you asked at the beginning were, is it legal, is it ethical, and will it work? So let's let's look at that will it work question because a, that's a big question mark. Yeah, it is, it is, it is in a way the biggest because uh, the whole point of this is addressing what is a perceived problem. The fact is, so far this year, 10,000 people have come across in small boats into the UK across the Channel. It's a massive problem, at least in terms of perception. There are many people in Britain who don't want these people coming in, who say that they cause all sorts of problems, not least perhaps driving down wages, all those other economic factors, of course, going on there at the moment. But it's a perceived problem, and various groups have been set up to try and look into it. Now, one of the most prominent is Migration Watch UK, and I spoke to uh, the chairman, Al Mehmet, and he told me really what he thought were the virtues of setting up something concrete like the Rwanda plan. Uh, let's look at what the ultimate objective is and, and why. First, the Rwanda deal is part of really the attempt to stop illegal crossings across the channel. These have been going up exponentially, frankly, over the last three, four years. Uh, already this year, we are getting on for three times the number crossing in, in rickety, dangerous little boats across the channel from a safe country, very often having already applied and been rejected for uh, asylum in uh, countries across Europe. So that is the objective, to stop that and to stop the traffickers from making really eye-watering amounts of money in this way by exploiting these uh, people who want to get here. Well, well let, me, let me make a point then and say, isn't the issue, though, in this that uh, there's no evidence that this will have that effect, that it will deter people from coming across or the traffickers uh, from assisting them? Sure, sure. No, I, I, I fully accept that. Uh, there is no evidence yet. However, um, I don't think, as, certainly as far as I was concerned, that was ever going to be the uh, complete solution. The people being sent to Rwanda, uh, if that materialises, that will be part of a, a, a wider effort, really, to stem the increasing, ever-increasing flow. So uh, in itself, no, uh, it, it won't persuade and dissuade people from uh, jumping into boats. However, if there is a serious attempt made and there are significant numbers being sent to Rwanda, then I think it will have an impact. Add to that the, uh, the, the, the plans for uh, 
holding on to, I hesitate to say detaining because um, it won't be that because uh, those who are held after getting here, if they're not being sent to Rwanda, they will actually be free to wander in and out, out of the, the camps that are being arranged for them um, rather than the hotels that they're in at the moment uh, from where they, they can actually move about. So it won't be detention. However, um, if we were to hold on to them until their uh, um, applications for asylum were uh, considered and decided, and that happened quickly, and then those who did not qualify were at that point removed, then I think together there certainly would be uh, an impact, especially if we say if you cross this way, as the Australians did, if you cross this way, you're not going to be given asylum. You're not going to be granted asylum. So yes, uh, Rwanda on its own won't actually be the complete solution, but I think it will help hugely if the government is serious about implementing it. But but, but the point in what you're saying is, I suppose, the implication to the people uh, that they will go to Rwanda, they will be allowed to be in Rwanda, um, and that this will stop them with their main objective, which is getting to the UK. But the evidence suggests that won't happen, because if you look at what went on with Israel trying this exact same uh, idea in Rwanda, the people Israel sent to Rwanda were either trafficked on, uh, some of them were abused, it seems, some even may have been tortured, um, but many of them found their way back to the camps, in, in Israel's case, back to Israel, in a way that meant it didn't work as, a, as, a, as, a, as an idea. It didn't actually fulfill that because it didn't keep them in Rwanda. Well, all I would say is that it did work with the Australians, and they, uh, frankly, virtually overnight, it stopped with the Australians. Uh, you, you say that people were uh, abused, um, ill-treated. That happens now with those who come here who are trafficked and never actually uh, um, come to light. And thousands are in that position. So I, I disagree that uh, the Israel experience somehow um, would uh, it, it discredits this this whole process? We don't know yet whether it will work. Frankly, um, I think that it could work, and it could be part of a wider solution. But and uh, but with Rwanda, um, the United Nations itself, the United the well, UNACR, the United. And Nations High Commission for Refugees, geez, they're already involved with uh, sending people seeking asylum to Rwanda from, from Libya. There's something like 30,000 Burundians who have, with the UN's blessing, been sent, been sent to uh, Rwanda. So I, I just won't accept that Rwanda somehow is uh, abusing, by sending people there, is abusing well, their human all rights. All right, perhaps... Perhaps not. it's not abusing. Abuse is possible in the sense that things can happen there. Now, we, we know, I mean, I, I've worked in Rwanda. I know that it's not a country necessarily where you can guarantee uh, levels uh, of care or security in a way that perhaps you can elsewhere um, for all sorts of reasons. But the point surely is that this is also uh, inhumane to the people who are being sent there. They are people who are being sent to a completely different part of the world, a completely alien part for many of them. And these are people who have the right to claim asylum. It's an established right under international law uh, in a country they consider safe. Uh, if they're going to Rwanda, there's no evidence that they are safe in that sense. Well, uh, you say they have a right to. Um, they, they have a right to apply for asylum. They don't have a right to be granted asylum. And very often, as I said earlier, they have applied for asylum and been rejected. And let's not also forget that a lot of them actually do come from Africa. So it's, it's hardly sending them to a strange alien environment when they've already come from that continent. Well, isn't that the point? They're trying to escape a situation and they're being sent back to a situation. No, they're, in most cases, they are looking for a better way of life. They are looking for an improvement to their conditions. They're looking for work. 
which one can understand, of course. Well, they have a right to do that. All human beings do, don't they? Well, well, of course they have a right to do that. But that is not what the original um, convention, the 1951 convention, the uh, European Convention on Human Rights, that's not what they were originally intended for. This is not uh, intended for economic migration, which is what the vast majority of those coming to this country and indeed making their way to, into the EU, into Europe, they're looking for a better life. That uh, it may be their right as individuals to do that, but it isn't our right uh, to accept everyone who says, I want to come here, I am coming here, whether you like it or not. That is not what sovereignty is all about. You should be able to decide who can and who cannot come to your country. You know, we hear a lot, don't we, that argument about economic refugees. And it's, it's a misused term because you could say, well, people coming from Ukraine are economic refugees because the economy is totally collapsed because it's at war. Well, any kind of def definition like that, I mean, even calling people illegal Mm. Uh, migrant. I mean, it's a very odd thing, and the legality of it is very strange. Well, it's, it's yeah, it's determined the outcome already, hasn't it? I've already decided what the status of these people is. But look, there were several things that came out of that, and we'll go back to uh, your discussion in just a moment. Uh, but he uh, he gave he he admitted there was no evidence that it, it's going to work, uh, and we'll go, we can look at Australia in a second. He admits that it's just part of a complete solution. Well, wouldn't it be good to know what the other components are as well, because then perhaps they'll work better, and we don't need to worry about this thing. Uh, he said. It won't in itself dissuade people from jumping onto boats. Yeah, so, well, well, so without Patel's else, it, own permanent secretary, a top civil servant, has actually said that there is absolutely no evidence that there's a deterrent effect in this. And, and they're spending mm. £120 million pounds on it. So yeah. it's a bit of a gamble. Even though it's not going to work. And uh, Australia is repeatedly given as an example of where it has worked. But it's not really. Uh, we, we, the situation in Australia was people were shipped overseas. Uh, they found themselves in uh, Nauru or Manus Island off Papua New Guinea. Yeah, so these are islands where, or areas where the, the Australians could pay in the same way yeah. uh, nations to take the people they didn't well, want. Well, slightly different. In the, the intention was that they would get, initially they would go over to those islands, they'd have their Australian visas processed, and if they were successful, then they'd come back to Australia uh, to live. But that is not what happened. It took them a, a very long time to process, and uh, and then they stopped it. And then all of a sudden, I mean, it was a real problem for Australia, tens of thousands of people. And, you know, goodness knows how many people were uh, were dying on the on the crossings. Uh, and so then they they played it hardline. So, it, first of all, those detention centres closed. There are people in Nauru now left in the uh, in, in the Nauru community. Nauru, by the way, is a population of 10,800. It's a tiny, tiny island. Uh, <laughs> I think there's about 1,000 refugees. So we're getting on for 10% of the population. So the only industry really in Nauru uh, was uh, dealing with Australian asylum seekers. But then, uh, because that really wasn't working, what Australia then did, which isn't talked about a great deal and is largely ignored in Australia now, even though everyone was horrified at the time, was that the Australian Border Force, which itself was renamed the Border Force rather than the Department of Immigration, which obviously is quite welcoming because we're yeah, allowing We've immigrants. got a Border Force as well. I know. Well, we, we copied them. Uh, so a border force uh, not only sounds like a peak time TV show, it also sounds like something that, you know, is uh, you, you've got a battle against. You it's know, not something sort of to be border feasible. service, is it? It's not. It's a force. Uh, and so the, the whole approach there now is that they turn around boats and they don't report on it. They, it is just shrouded in secrecy. So, so they take the, push the boats back to wherever they've come from. Uh, supposedly. Yeah, we don't and know. What, we don't. Yeah, we, we don't yeah. know, and we don't know how often that happens. We don't know if anyone dies in the process because on water matters or whatever they refer to it as are are not reported on now because if they reported on them then that might encourage the people smugglers so but it's worked in the sense i mean that, that you don't get many well we don't, uh, no, no zero arrive on the shores of, of australia supposedly well we don't know because they don't report the numbers anymore but look this is the let, let, let's give you a sense of the australian approach because i think this is where we're heading this is admiral justin jones uh, on the australian border force website just basically explain, explaining that they are closed to illegal immigrants in, a, in Australia. Illegal immigrants, not allowed Australia in. is resolute. Our border protection policies have not and will not change. No one who attempts to travel illegally by boat will settle here. No matter who you are or where you're from, our borders are closed to illegal migration. The only way to Australia is with a valid visa. 
you have zero chance of illegal migration. <laughs> Very menacing music uh, there. We didn't put that on, did we? Did we no, that, that, is, point? that is how they portray it. That's yeah, their exactly. own choice of music. <laughs> mm. So that's because you've got to be scared. You've got to be very scared. That's well, the... you know, and, and actually, I wonder if perhaps uh, the countries that, uh, that the Australians tried to push these people onto in the first place mm. also had reason uh, to, to be scared, to have people put to them that, that clearly Australians couldn't deal with. And the same principle applies with Rwanda, because in this case, we're a, a big developed country with lots of money, and we are paying another less developed country to take our problems away. Now, if in other circumstances, mm. people would say this is just colonial domination, post-colonial domination, and it's not right, and we shouldn't be doing it. Yeah, well, that, that is a point you made, isn't it, Al Mermot, who we heard from earlier from uh, Migration Watch, about, you know, you, you, you said, surely this is self-defeating. Why can't we process them locally? Isn't outsourcing really just an admission of failure? Well, uh, hold on a moment. Um, the, the implication of what you say is that we don't do that. Whereas we have taken in thousands and thousands over the years of people who uh, we, we make appropriate arrangements for. We know how many are coming. We make arrangements for their housing, for their schooling, if their children involved. And thousands have come. Uh, we have resettled or uh, given uh, refuge to more people over the last six, seven years than any other country in Europe. And there have been any number of safe routes that have been made available. And more recently, of course, we have also said to Hong Kongers, we are taking in Ukrainians, we're taking in people from uh, Afghanistan. There has to be some common sense here. Frankly, you cannot simply say to the 100 million people, according to the, the UN, who are now displaced and looking for somewhere to live. And even more than that, the number of people in poor circumstances who are looking for a better way of life. Is there going to be no limit to the numbers that we take from uh, these circumstances, from these numbers from around the world? But also these people are contributors potentially to our economy. We, we know, for example, that we at the moment in this country, we have a very large number of jobs and many of them unfilled. That's because perhaps historically uh, Brexit meant that fewer people come from the European Union who would otherwise have, have filled those jobs. But overall, it also means that we have a lot of care areas where uh, people are not getting the care they need. We just see what's going on in the airports uh, at the moment for knowing the number of people who are not employed there who should be. Aren't we actually in need of a, a labour force coming in, people willing to do jobs that perhaps we aren't, in order to keep our country going? Well, um, some of what you say is, is of course, true. Um, there are employers looking for uh, labour uh, of, of all sorts. Um, however, if you take, uh, perhaps you, you didn't see the, the number of, uh, visa grants for long-term uh, work included that were issued in uh, just over a year uh, to the year um, in March 2022, over a, a million visa grants there. So it's, it's hardly uh, a case of employers not being able to bring people over. In fact, um, there was something like uh, um, uh, almost 300,000 work visas, I think 280,000 uh, mm. given long-term visas for people to come here. Uh, the other factor is that um, there are, in fact, millions of people in this country who are employed, but nevertheless would like more work. They have the uh, ability, they have uh, the, uh, the scope for taking on more work and would like that more work, and we choose to ignore them. There are something like 4 million people we, 
we estimate in, in that position. And yet there's no effort made to do that. Well, I must admit, I find that a very curious statement. You, because, you were raising your eyebrows in that. That's <laughs> because we've got a histrionic man, if I may say so. But, but yeah, what's, what's the point? Because <laughs> our unemployment rate is 3.8%. I don't think it's ever been lower in recent history. Uh, and yet he's saying that there are people looking for work. I mean, uh, if, they, if they're looking for work, they can go and get a job because there's loads of them out there. Yeah, and the gap remains, and, and the gap was filled by people who we're now trying to get rid of. Um, let's just let's just look at some of the facts about the Rwanda plan itself, because that's what we're talking about. And I think we, we should actually put out there what the details are. Now, what happens is people who arrived in the UK by um, means that are not legal, as the government would put it, since the 1st of January can be set to Rwanda. Then their asylum claims will be processed while they're there. While their claims are being considered, they'll be given accommodation and support, at least in theory. Uh, those whose claims are accepted will be helped to build, quote, a new life in Rwanda uh, with up to five years access to education and support and those whose claims are rejected will be given the chance to apply to remain in Rwanda or be removed to their country of origin. So they're not coming back here. That's the point. Yeah, but that is, I mean, that is exactly the point, isn't it? That if you, you know, if you try and get here, you're not going to stay here. Like the like the Australian music, all we need is the histrionic music in the background to uh, invoke a bit of excitement and fear uh, and then we'll get there. But, you know, I mean, he did make some points that, you know, how do, where do you draw the line? If you have lots of uh, migrants seeking asylum in your country because the, there are, uh, well, the UNHCR figure is there, 82 million. I think he said 100. It probably is 100 now because we've had at well, least 14, Ukraine, so 14 million at least out of yeah, Ukraine. So it's, it's over 100. That's fair. Yeah. So, uh, but we are doing, you know, we, we are taking quite a number of asylum seekers. He's right on that. But we're probably not doing our fair share if we look at, uh, I mean, he made the point that we're taking more than anyone anywhere else in, in Europe. Is that true? I'm not sure if it's true, but certainly we are not processing anywhere near as many asylum admissions. Now, we actually accept quite a few more than the French do, for example. So if you apply in France, there's every chance that you're going to get rejected, which is why he made the point that people have another go in the UK, because we accept 50 or 60 percent, whereas they accept maybe 20 or 25 percent. But if you look at uh, we had 48,000 asylum claims last year well up on 30,000 from the year before, uh, basically between 25 and 30 has been the normal normal number for the last couple of decades, not really increasing a great deal. But in half a year, in the last two quarters, we've had 31,000 claims. So the number has shot up because of what's going on in the world. So in, in six months, basically, we've had what we normally have in a full year. But for perspective, in 2021, Germany had 150,000 applications. France had 100,000. In total, the European Union has had more than half a million, 535,000 applications. So if you add us to the European total, because we're not part of Europe anymore, then we receive about 8% of all those asylum claims. So we are... And, and it's because it's harder to get here. It is. You know, if you look at Ireland, they get even less because it's even harder to get to Ireland. Yeah. If you, I'm sure Iceland gets hardly any. So it is to do with the geography, isn't it? It is. It is. But the, the, the numbers are interesting. Numbers are important. And that's one of the things we said we were going to do in this podcast is look mm. at the facts, look at the numbers. But all these people are individuals with lives, with desperate situations, fleeing persecution, fleeing all kinds of, of issues and trying to find a new lives for themselves. And that's really where it comes back to the ethical question. Yeah. What right do we have to say no to these people? Yeah. And the legal question, you know, the other the, mm. the other one of your three questions. Uh, and maybe that legal question is what is going to stop it happening. Here's Stephanie Harrison, who's a barrister at Garden Court Chambers in London, speaking at the Human Rights Joint Committee at Westminster yesterday. And I think we have to start from the premise when we're looking at international law obligations to the significance of the fact that the United Kingdom is effectively offloading its international law obligation to offer asylum to those who make it to the shores of the UK and claim it uh, to another country. And that, in my view, is a really significant uh, inroad in what was perhaps the most important human rights um, statement following fascism and following the Second World War. That Article 14 of the 1948 Universal Declaration on Human Rights made the, made the declaration that any person who is not, who is not able to enjoy minimum core fundamental rights in their own state will be provided with those rights in another country uh, in which they make claims. So I think we shouldn't start off from anything other than recognising that this is a very substantial departure from a core aspect of A, the universality of fundamental rights and also the UK's commitment to ensuring that those rights are 
uh, are provided by the United Kingdom are not offloaded to a third state. Well, and that is the nub of the issue, isn't it, really, that she's just demonstrating there? That's the, the you know, the, the reason why perhaps it's not going to happen. Yeah, but I can hear people, assuming there is anyone listening to this, screaming <laughs> at, at, at their machine and saying, hang on, but there is a problem. It is difficult. It isn't something we can just accept. Everybody who wants to come here and we've got to find a way. And there is, a, at the moment, the government's proposed a way. It may not be the best way, may not even be practical, but they're doing something. But do you know why I think they're doing it? It's because I think the, the, there's a very British problem here. And I can say this as someone who spent, you know, a large part of his life not living in this country. So I can you look can at tell it. by the twang, there's an Australian yeah, bit in here. Mate, I can tell you. Uh, but I can see, if, you know, two, two British problems, bureaucracy and the ability, inability to say no. So if you look at, uh, first of all, the number of applications and how slow we're processing them. So the asylum applications for the year ending Q1 2022, so the latest figures we've got, 55,146. And yet at that point, so in March this year, there were almost 110,000 applications, twice the applications over the last year, 110,000 still waiting for a decision, double the number that we're getting in a year. It is also about four times the number that was pending four, four years ago. So we've got this rising number because we just can't process them fast enough. So, for example, in 2020, there were 1,422 applications from Syrian refugees. No decision was made on 342 of them. That's all. Uh, of which 132 were refused. The rest were granted asylum. There's 209 people. But 1,123 people waiting a decision. We just can't get through them fast enough. And when we do make a decision uh, for Syrian refugees, for example, it is overwhelmingly in favour of granting them asylum. So we, hence, you know, we're shipping them out because we're a bit worried that we just can't say no to them. Whereas if you look at the French... They process them so much faster, but they say no more often, which is no. probably probably more, which is probably why we're getting them over here. And I saw a very harrowing uh, video on uh, France twenty four, uh, showing the uh, showing them deporting people forcibly, actually tying their legs and hands and carrying them like a rolled up carpet onto a plane to get them out of France. So we're getting to a point where I think we. Maybe need to draw this to a conclusion, but let's return, I suppose, finally to our three questions. Is it legal, this Rwanda plan? Well, that's going to be debated in the High Court, but there are certainly question marks. Is it ethical? Well, probably not, at least according to many people who see it as our duty to take in people who want some kind of help from the outside world and not our duty to impose what people we don't want on countries by just paying them money to take them away. And thirdly, will it work? Well, from what you were saying, Phil, it doesn't seem like it's likely to. Perhaps we've just got to adopt a more French way in dealing with these things, or perhaps we just say welcome to everyone. But that's pretty much it from this edition of the Y Curve podcast, looking at the UK government's Rwanda plan. And next time, inflation is going up and it's only going to get worse. Oil prices are partially to blame for that. And Brent crude prices have been edging up over $124 lately, double where they were before the pandemic. Add to that all the supply chain problems. But central banks think they can fix all of these problems just by lifting interest rates. Well, can they? Will it really work? We'll look at that next week. Thanks for joining us on The Y Curve. The Y Curve.